This is a recording from Tapewood Community Garden Workshop on working with nature to create a vibrant and healthy garden. It was delivered by Gabrielle Flynn, a conservation officer for Bug Life. Here is part two, the shoots, where she talked about pollinators. So on to pollinators, so the shoots side of things. Um, so we have many, many different kinds of pollinators um, in, in the world and in the UK and in Scotland. Um, and honeybees make a very, very, very small fraction of those, even though they get all the credit. Um, so wild bees are actually far, far more important as pollinators than honeybees are. Um, and, it's, and it's the wild bees that we really have to be concerned about um, when we're thinking about our pollinator services and conservation. Um, so in the UK we have 267 species of bee, 90% uh, of those are solitary bees, um, and then we have bumblebees, and then we have a species of, of honeybee, just one. Um, we have a subspecies which is known as the black honeybee, which you've probably heard of. Um, so we also have wasps, which, are, which can be pollinators as well, hoverflies, beetles, butterflies and moths. Um, so, why are pollinators so important? Well, they help plants reproduce. And if plants reproduce, then they can't make seeds, and if they can't make seeds, then they also are not going to make fruit. Um, so they're really, really important for our agriculture, as we've spoken about previously. Um, so, some, some plants specifically attract certain kinds of pollinators. So, for example, tomato plants um, want to specifically attract bumblebees because bumblebees can do a specific kind of pollination called buzz pollination um, where they're ah. yeah buzz pollination where they actually <laughs> shake they shake and they make a really high pitched high pitched buzz and it shakes the pollen off um, and allows them to, to pollinate properly um, so actually only bumblebees can pollinate tomato plants um, um, so they're also important for keeping the our wild ecosystems going so without pollinators you're not going to get more and more seeds to 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 green the whole countryside year on year um, so not just important as, as agricultural sort of sort of for agricultural job um, so just to give you an idea of the difference between hand pollination and, and bug pollination so if you think about the fact that insects and plants have been evolving side by side for millions and millions of years they've they've evolved a really delicate relationship and um, something that looks a lot uh, it looks a look can look quite clumsy and it can look like it's very inspecific but the relationship is very very um, close and um, so for example um, flowers although they might look yellow or red or purple to us and um, they also emit um, sort of or reflect UV light and insects like bees can see UV light so when they look at a flower, they don't just see a yellow flower, they see a yellow flower with a big target in the middle as well. Um, so flowers have evolved to try and really attract those pollinators to them. Um, so they don't just colour themselves according to attract the bees, um, but when a bee flies onto a flower, the pollen also flies to the bee. Um, so as a bee or a butterfly flies through the air, all the electrons, you're going to learn this in high school, <laughs> all, the, all the electrons actually fly off the bee, so the air is pushing all those electrons off, so the bee actually ends up becoming positively charged. Um, and when it lands on the flower, just before it lands on the flower, the flower becomes negatively charged <coughs> if it's full of nectar. And then once the bee lands on the flower, it's, they're obviously attracted to one another and the pollen actually flies off onto the onto the bee and then once it empties its nectar the flower then becomes positively charged and this is sending out a signal to the pollinators i am empty don't bother coming to me and the value of, of sort of communicating to the pollinators whether they're full or empty of nectar is that they become a reliable source of food and the bees are more likely to come back to that particular flower because they know that it's advertising itself correctly um, so so the, the, you can see the relationship's quite delicate. Um, as such, when humans come along with their paintbrushes and they start trying to whack the flowers and, and pollinate themselves, the fruit end up looking a bit wrinkly and a bit unappetising like that because we haven't evolved that relationship over, over millions of years. Um, 
Um, we're not as effective <laughs> at pollinating as well. Yeah, we're not as effective as pollinating. And, and also, bees tend to do it for free, whereas sort of people generally don't. <laughs> so, this is a honeybee. Looks a bit waspy. Um, but this is our honeybee, creator of honey and, 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 a, and, a, and a good pollinator. Um, it's not as hard working as the, as the bumblebee, so the bumblebee will get up earlier in the morning and it'll go home later at night, and it'll also come out in all sorts of weather, whereas other bees tend to be a bit pickier and a bit lazier. Um, so honeys, honeybees and bumblebees are social bees, so they live in big colonies like ants do, they're part of the same, part of the same family. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so the, they have a queen, or sometimes several queens, um, and they all work together as a big sort of family of, of sisters and brothers to sort of get the next generation on. Um, so honeybee queens can live for years and years, but bunny, bumblebee queens don't, and they'll live for about a year to nine months. They'll, they'll be born, actually they'll, about a year to 18 months correct myself there. So they'll be born in around the end of summer this year, um, once the colony is productive enough. So that's the key thing. If you want bees for the next year, then the colonies have to be productive. So they have to get enough resources um, and enough food to make sure that there's uh, a new generation of males and queens. Um, so once they start producing males and queens, they'll go off, they'll breed, they'll eat loads and loads of food, get really fat, and then they'll go under the ground and, and hide there till the next spring. And then they'll be born, in, or not born, but they'll re-emerge in about February time. <coughs> um, and then they'll eat lots and lots and lots of food and they'll start to lay eggs in their colony in the ground or, or wherever else they nest. Um, and then the workers only live for a few weeks, um, but she's constantly producing new workers. And eventually, again, when the colony's sort of gotten enough food to stop to produce, she'll start to produce queens and males again um, so the colonies are very very short-lived and they don't they don't overwinter they just die off at the end of summer or sort of autumn time whereas in honeybees they will keep sort of a population of workers and they'll mm. feed off the honey over winter um, so that's that's what a bumblebee colony looks like um, so that's one I worked with in the lab. Um, so they, they, they look a bit messier than the honeybee colonies. They're not they've not got honeycombs, they've just got these sort of pots made of sort of pollen and spit. Um, and inside them are the newly growing bumblebees. And once they hatch they'll use the little pots um to store nectar in so that they can all drink from it. Like larders within the bumblebee colony. Is that for human consumption <coughs> What is what? Is it for human consumption? That particular... Yeah. No, 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 that was... It's I've... just purely there. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what does social mean? I've actually already gone through that. <laughs> so they live in a big colony and they're all working together to produce the next generation. Um, why is being social good? Why is it helpful? Um, well, they're more likely to be able to defend themselves through stinging and um, through, through hissing. So if you ever approach a bumblebee colony and you shake it, then they don't, they don't all go bzzz, they all go shh, and it makes them sound a bit like a snake. Um, well, that's, the, that's why we think it evolved, so they're imitating like, sort of things like snakes, um, so people won't go, or predators won't go near it. Um, so it's good because it, they're more able to defend themselves, um, and they're also more able to forage. Um, there's that. There's there's a whole course in there about about the benefits of living in a group and shoaling fish and all sorts, but I won't go into that. Um, so bumblebee pollination. Um, like I said, they they collect nectar and pollen. So nectar is their carbohydrate source, and this is mostly important for the adults. And the pollen is their protein source. <coughs> um, they also use it to build with. Um, but they have a sort of a. a uh, they, their interaction with other bees actually helps pollination. So um, they've done studies uh, on blueberry plantations in America and they found the greater diversity of bees and pollinators you have on the site, the greater the pollination and the greater the yield. Um, and that's because when you have lots of different kinds of bees competing with each other, they're forced to go in random directions rather than just going from flower to flower to flower to flower, because they're not competing with each other. Um, whereas if you have bumblebees and honeybees and solitary bees, then they're forced to like avoid each other and go to different, and the pollination is better, and it's, and it's 
create a sort of better blueberries. Um, so do they have to, well, do they have to <coughs> deal with the planting in order to attract all them? So do they yeah. Have, what kind of things do they have grown around? Them? Well, they have to have habitat for them. Yeah. So they've, they've found that farmers can improve their yields not by intensive farming and not by having massive bits of, of farm, which mm. is what we traditionally thought after World War II was that we just needed to create bigger farms. Um, but actually we're, we're now starting to be a bit smarter about it and a bit more ecologically clever and we're like, well, actually, you could have a smaller farm but if you put habitat next to it then you're going to Im improve your yield anyway um, because you're, you're catering for the services that are helping to create your crop in the first place. Um, so it's just about improving our knowledge um, and providing for the, for the things that are providing for us. Um, so yeah, they, they have like wildflower meadows next to their land and woodland next to their land. Um, so woodland is actually a, a good place for pollinators as well to sort of uh, hide away in. The people who are growing under cover can actually buy colonies of bumblebees to put in. Yeah, that's got its yeah. own problems. Yeah, yeah, it's got its own problems too. Because when you start importing animals, mm -hmm. you're importing all the diseases that come mm -hmm. with them. And they're made in these horrible fat bee and factories. They're, and they're inbred, so, yeah. Uh, spread the diseases inside. They're inbred, so they're genetically weak anyway, and they spread disease. So the importation of honeybees and bumblebees is something that we're now trying to sort of fight against because it's just making the problem of bee decline mm -hmm. worse. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Well, well. In rural Yorkshire, they were a lot of the farmers in the rural parts anyway were leaving a twelve foot wide strip. Yeah. And they were planting hedges as well. Yeah. They'd already ripped out years ago. Yeah. Because they make five, six fields into one. Yeah. So they got dust, dust blow. But with putting these things around, it's it's made a big difference to the fertility of the crop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a good case study there. Yeah. 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 So the the, yeah, the more we learn, the more we're understanding that you actually have to mm. provide space for the for the pollinators that you need to come the, come to the crops. Yeah, the the advantage is that although many birds are seed eaters, yeah, <coughs> they when they're having chicks and young they feed them on insects. Mm -hmm. So whilst a seed eater you might think hasn't got a problem on farmland, they do. In mm. Keeping the young, so actually they're encouraging this. Um, so the Game Conservatory Trust are encouraging the farmers to to have extended headlands and beetle banks yeah. in order to provide the invertebrates yeah. to keep the partridge chicks healthy. And yeah. So um, just there's multiple reasons why. Exactly. Yeah. Once you're helping bugs, you're helping everything else, mm. um, which is kind of like it's the bottom end of the food chain. Yeah. Which is always the benefit, because... In, <laughs> yeah, in, in the States, they, they transport bees huge distances across um, the West yeah. Coast and California, where yeah. to, and take the diseases with, with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Massive so problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, this is a mining bee. Um, mining bees make up the vast majority of solitary bees, so 75% I think 75 to 80 percent of solitary bees are actually mining bees. Mining bees mine down into the ground. So if you ever see little holes in a in a sort of sandy bit of soil, then it's probably going to be a, a mining bee. Um, again, they they're not social, so they'll go down into the ground, they'll lay their eggs, and they'll leave a nice big chunky pollen ball for for their eggs when they when they hatch. Um, and that looks a bit like that. <laughs> Um, and then the rest, uh, there's, there's many, many solitary bees, but I'm focusing on a few here, because it's, otherwise it's too, too, too overwhelming. Um, so there's cavity nesting bees. So cavity nesting bees are the ones that we're catering for when we stick bamboo sticks into those plastic bottles. Um, so get many different sizes of cavity nesting bees, so lots of different sized holes are, are good for them. Um, so you get things like, what have I got first? Mason bees. So mason bees are the ones that use mud. Um, and then you've got red mason bees. Fun fact about red mason bee, one single red mason bee um, does 120 times the work of a single honeybee. So they are very, very, very hard working, very, very good pollinators. What about carder bees? Uh, I so find a, a banded carder bee. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. What do they like? Um, so 
they're they're actually co so common carter bees and shrill carter bees are a type of bumblebee, um. So they're they're more likely to be, uh, social. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. They'll, they'll also so they'll not only use the things that we make for them. Obviously, they have a natural snail way of, of nesting as well. So they'll actually use snail shells. Um, so they they take, they've gone into an old snail shell and they've if they've nested in there. Um, and uh, and they'll also they'll also go in things like walls and and bricks and that kind of thing. Um, so this is a leaf cutter bee. What a leaf cutter bee will do will cut the leaves. Um, and it will use them to line the inside of the cavity, but also use them to block off each cell where the little egg and pollen ball stay. Will it do that on the leaf, or will it take them? It'll, it'll take it to. It'll take it to the hole oh. and carry it away, and, oh. and it will line the nest with it. What's that? Sorry. <laughs> Do they reuse sites? So if they've nested both the solitary bees and the, the social bees. Because wasps, I know, don't. If they nest in, they don't reuse the same nest. It's what happens with, with solitary bees? If you've got a um, one of these things, for instance, and, and they've colonised a tube, is that tube the next year redundant, or do they come? No, no, the no. I, could, I, I know. I don't know if the sort of genetically similar, because they're not going to live year on year. They're not good. They're not. They don't live for years and years. Um, you might get related species coming back because they're local by that point. Um, I'm actually not too sure if they sort of learn that that area is good, but you, it will get used again. Maybe not by the same related bees that were born there, but maybe by other. So it's it's not completely sort of unused after that. Because I've, I've rather unsuccessfully built up bee nest in an inverted flower pot, etc with some hose pipe and some netting and, and yeah. it didn't get colonised but if that does get colonised is there a good case for the following year cleaning it out? No, so you want to keep it, it as natural as possible, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think people are often tempted to sort of do the human thing and make it sort of tidy again but actually um, the best thing to do is to let nature run its course as much as possible really. So that, I mean presumably they, these Those nests are great places for parasites of bees. Yeah. So all the kind of mites and other such things that would parasitise bees are going to hang around in yeah. bee nests. Although nests. most mites aren't, aren't actually, aren't actually um, a big threat to bees. Most of them are quite um, benign. So there's not a varroa equivalent? Um, of solitary bees? Yeah. There will be, but the thing with the thing with varroa mite because they live in a social environment, it's obviously it's yeah it spreads mm -hmm. a lot faster. Um, but mites uh, mites aren't a big problem when it comes to bees. Varroa is, um, but there's a lot more threats facing them um, other than other than mites. But yeah, most mites are benign. Do those pseudoscorpions do any harm? No. No, the big massive queen bumblebee, and you can see them clinging on. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think they. I don't think they do any harm. No, um, but again, it's it's all it's all natural. It's all it's okay for some bumblebees to be killed and some bees to be killed because yeah, that's just part of part of the way nature goes. Um, it's when they have additional threats that it becomes a problem, and that sort of small, more normal threats are. So that if you have lots and lots of threats from some climate change and pesticides and habitat destruction, then, then yeah, predators and mites start to become a problem. Um, but alone, in their sort of natural state, I mean, that's just the way ecosystems work. Um, um, so this is a this is a wool carder bee, and they're the ones that will actually snip the hair from things like foxglove, and 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 use that to make their nests within cavities instead of leaves or mud. Um, and then finally, the carpenter bee. Um, so don't get violet, or as far as I know, we haven't ever found a violet carpenter bee in Scotland yet, but it is found in southern England. Um, it's very very pretty. And violet, violet in colour and has iridescent wings. Violet. Yeah, <laughs> violet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you misread it there? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> not violet. <laughs> um, so uh, another cavity nesting bee, as you can imagine, it uses sort of wood pulp and that kind of things to to create its nest. 
Um, so what are the threats facing wild bees? Nicely, it would be good if that was the slide straight after there. Um, so what are the threats facing bees? Um, so our farming style. After World War II, um, our farming technique came, became very intensive and very large scale, um, obviously because we'd been through a trauma and we needed food as quickly as possible. Um, and we needed a lot of the resources during World, World War II as well. This is why we lost 97% of our meadows. <coughs> this is why we lost 98% of our woodlands, because of the World Wars. Um, so farm became intensive and we lost a lot of our habitat. And as a result, we've lost a lot of our wildlife. Um, with that, we've also got increasing disease. So as we're shipping bees in and, and other invasive species are coming in and climate change is increasing the temperature, um, disease is increasing and spreading fast, um, as it is in humans as well. Um, climate change is having a big impact. Bumblebees are a cold weather bee. Um, so as the temperature increases, it's, it's impacting them negatively. Um, and you're actually finding that some bumblebee species are, are migrating north, um, such as the tree bum such as the tree bumblebee. Um, pesticides. So obviously pesticides do what they say on the tin. They uh, they they kill they kill invertebrates um, or seriously damage them. Um, the one that we're most concerned about at the moment is neonicotinoid pesticide, which is the most widely used pesticide. Um, it attacks the brain and the nervous system. It causes bees to lose their memory or have poor memory and um, poor learning skills. Um, and as, as a result, their productivity, productivity goes really low. They're not able to make queens and males for the next season. And then you just get less and less bees year on year. Um, and the, their pollination services are completely suffer as well. Um, and things like bug clear, isn't it? I was reading about it. Bug clear. Yeah, so it's mostly used in agriculture, um, but that's worrying to know that it's also used in sort of more right commercial. Seed treated with it before it's planted. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So they actually put yeah. it on seed. Mm -hmm. So you be careful where you get your seed from. Mm. Um, we usually get our seeds, so our, our Scottish native seeds, from Scotia seeds, mm -hmm. um, because they're sort of the most environmentally friendly. Um, so, uh, thanks to EU legislation, this uh, particular pesticide has been banned for the last three years um, and it's being reviewed this October. Um, for momentarily, Westminster tried to ignore the ban this year, um, but then they, they decided not to ignore it. Um, but we've act they've actually found, um, they've done a few studies on the results on what's happened during this ban and um, rapeseed oil yield went up. So. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, and there's a lot of sort of cases to say that the, the pesticide itself isn't actually particularly good at what it does. Um, and sort of the real victim and victims in this whole thing is not only the bees but also the farmers because the farmers are stuck between one side where they've got money hungry companies such as Bayer and Syngenta who are desperately trying, trying to sell a product and tell them that it's good and tell them that it's not affecting their pollination service and then they've got conservationists, conservationists and ecologists on the other side being like not good you're affecting the long-term productivity blah, blah, blah. so they're just like ah, I got two sides so we really have to get better at working with farmers to, to help them to find alternatives for pesticides and that's something the bug bites try really hard to do. In your home garden, apparently, say only if you glance at it, it's better to do it later on, an hour before sunrise, uh, sorry, sunset, so it dries out and is more effective, but also you do see no longer coming. Yeah. So I, I don't know whether that applies to other pesticides. Yeah. Best thing is to not use them at all. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I have to use them on paths. Actually. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, what we use in our paths is just salt. So we just sprinkle salt on our weeds, and they yeah. Well, boiling water can do the same apparently. Yeah, I've never tried that. I'll try that next time. Um, and you another a lot of insects in the soil. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another another thing another another sort of threat now facing them is is also the intensive honeybee industry. So honeybees are good; they're an important part of our natural ecosystem as well. Um, but because um, because sort of uh, people are turning to uh, using uh, honeybees and, and creating honeybee farms as a as a solution to the bee problem, um, 
what they're actually doing is bringing more disease into the country because they're not necessarily mm. regulating where they're coming from. Um, but they're also taking resources from our wild bees. So in a honeybee colony, you have thousands and thousands of bees. In a bumblebee colony, you have between 50 and 150 bumblebees. And in a solitary bee nest, obviously, you only have like, one solitary bee. Um, and so then you have these honeybee colonies come along en masse. There's thousands of them, and they just they take all the resources. And there's now lots of studies being done on the impact of the honeybee industry um, on wild bee populations. Now, the way to counteract this is if you're going to have a honeybee colony to make honey, um, then make sure that you also plant wildflower meadows to make sure that there's enough resources for both the wild bees and the honeybees. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, how to protect them? Uh, you want to plant sort of flowering shrubs and, um, and orchards are excellent um, and also sort of native wildflower meadows. There's um, sort of some couple of ideas for different times of year of what, what kind of things you want in your garden. So in spring you can have things like cuckoo flower, bugle, buttercup, plenty of buttercup everywhere. Um, in summer you can have things like field scabious, viper bug loss and kidney vetch. Um, and then in late summer and autumn you can have things like common knapweed, ivy, teasel, and wild carrot. Um, so you can have lots of different kinds of things. Um, what you can also do is sort of create wild bee habitats, um, such as that there, <laughs> one I made earlier. <laughs> um, you can also sort of um, you can also limit limit your pesticide use. Obviously, you have to. If gardeners sort of have a tendency to use it, especially for things like slugs. Um, so if you are going to use them, try and limit it as much as you possibly can. Um, but also, we need to sort of be smarter about our farming and, and work with nature rather than against it. Um, and and be responsible honeybee farmers. So provide the habitat if we are going to if we are going to do do honeybee farming. Um, sorry, that's not sure you can see that very well. So just to round off, <laughs> um, invertebrates in your garden. We have sort of learned today that diversity is key. Um, and that you need to provide habitat for all the kind of things that you want to encourage. So if you want to encourage beetles, then you need to provide the dead wood and the dead leaves and everything that they need to survive. Um, and if you want to encourage a healthy yield of, of, your, of the, your plants, or if you want to make sure that your sort of flowering, pretty, more sort of aesthetically pleasing plants are healthy, then make sure that they've got the, the bugs they need to keep them healthy. Um, so, sort of... Trying to follow the way an ecosystem works naturally as much as possible is, is the best way to go. They need the top predators as well as well as the pests, as well as the annoying mites, as well as the so the everything is important and has its place. Um, we've covered that already, yeah. <laughs> um, and we've covered that too, and that. <laughs> um, so that's the the bug home that we made just there, and um, so this is a ladybird home, so you can see it hanging from a tree, Somebody, it's as simple as that, just to hang it from the tree, and then hopefully it will be colonised by something. Best time of year to hang it is about August, September time, just when things are sort of looking to eat up a lot of food and, and hide away. Um, these are the bug hotels I mentioned earlier for, for woodlouse and for centipedes, so they hide away in the leaves and the, in the in the mesh, in the chicken wire mesh. So if you do want to tidy away your leaves, then you can at least make a home out of it. Um, mm -hmm. This is a more complex uh, bug hotel, should you ever want to make one. Um, so it's a sort of bigger version of that plant pot one that we made um, behind there. Um, so people have just taken um, crates, piled them on top of each other and stuffed them full of pine cones and leaves and sticks and all sorts. Just You can be as inventive as you want. Um, and actually at the top they've got solitary bee homes that they've put, so they've just taken bits of wood and drilled holes into them, different sizes, and they've put a couple of those in as well. Um, so you've got your whole ecosystem in one thing there. It's got a roof on it. And yeah, it's got a roof on it. <coughs> it's very cute. Mm -hmm. um, also, where possible, try to use peat-free compost. Gardeners always shrink back when I, when I advise this, because they, they really don't like it. Um, but if we bear in mind that peatland bogs have taken millennia to evolve. Once you remove them, they're gone. They're not coming back until until we're all gone. Um, 
so you you are wiping out something that's 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 not going to come back in a year's time. It is just gone. <coughs> and the and peat bogs are really important for a variety of wildlife, but they're also really important as they provide an ecosystem service for us in terms of flood <coughs> management. And um, so we manage a peat bog. We're trying to restore it back to full health again after it was used for for a forestry bit of land. Um, and we found that, that our peatland bog um, captured over 100 million litres of water during the winter period. Um, so they are really important as that natural mm. sponge. So if we want to avoid flooding in cities and towns, then we need to keep our natural habitats intact. Um, so yeah, you can get wool compost, you can miracle grow do one. Um, every single gardening store does do them. I know they're not as good as peat, but they are more sustainable. And if we keep harvesting peat, then you're not going to have peat anyway. So we're going to have event eventually have to use this stuff anyway. So the more the more people buy into it, the more it will improve and the technology mm. will get better. Um, we have an invertebrate newsletter which goes out once a month. Um, all it does is tell you about events that are coming up, little bits of sort of news, um, and also sort of uh, training sessions and that kind of thing that you can get involved with. If you do want to sign up, let me know, and I'll write your email down. Um, I think that's me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs>